Hi, everyone. My name is Chloe Vizdari, and I am the VP of Strategy over at Point3 Security. And today I have a very special guest, Adivian Olam. Steven, would you like to say hello? Hey, how's it going? Wonderful. Um, so Adivian is going to be talking a little bit about how to de-escalate situations and also communication. And I'm assuming there will also be a part about empathy. Um, but I'm looking really forward to his talk. I saw it at uh, B-Sides Orlando last year, and I was like, oh my god, this talk is one of my favorite talks of the year, and it still is, because I say cognitive science and de-escalation was something that I was trying to learn as much as possible how the brain works. So I really like your talk, and I'm so happy that I get to have you on this webinar. So thank you for joining. I'm really happy uh, to be here. Wonderful. All right. So I know you made some, you have a presentation for us. So please go ahead and dive in and then we'll take right. live Q and a afterwards. Well, I'll try to uh, get a screen share working here and let's see if you can see what I hope you can see. Does yes, that I work for you? It. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. So yes, uh, this is a slightly revised version of something I presented in Orlando. And it was a real thrill to see the traction and impact that it made at the time. I got more feedback about this than almost any lock picking or physical type security talk I've ever given. In a way, it's a physical security talk. I, I slant it heavily towards the fact that our events and our community spaces and our organizations could sometimes be doing more to keep people safe. And the way in which we interact with people, sometimes particularly problem people, uh, has not been ideal. But that's often stemmed from a lack of training and a lack of awareness, and that's what we hope to improve upon. So, de-escalation, using emotional intelligence and, as I like to say, turning off your inner caps lock. Uh, because the whole thing, when it comes to managing and containing situations, especially risky situations, usually comes down to if you get mad, you lose. And the more you can control your own emotions, the more you can find a way of applying those emotions to the situation, the better you can manage the emotions of others. And that's what I'd like to see us do a lot better. So most people know me as this physical security person, not particularly as maybe the full roles that I have. People know me as a physical penetration specialist where my team and I do covert entry work and site assessments and break into buildings. And that's a fun time. And I love giving those talks, and I've given plenty of presentations and trainings about that kind of knowledge. Uh, people don't always know that our team is more diverse than that, that we have done physical security for executives, we have people trained in close protection, we have coordinated physical security for whole events. Uh, I myself am in charge of the security as well as well, everything uh, at events that I run. I run many small events and around the con scene, and thinking about physical security questions, I mean, some of the things I run are events that are firearm centric, right? And you get a whole bunch of people together and a lot of different voices and there's guns in the mix. If, if someone is potentially causing a hazardous situation or causing a problem for others, think about the challenges that can present if you have to go over and confront them and say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Is everybody having a good time? What's up? Uh, I'm proud to say that despite all of the wide array of hardware that's been around at many events that I run, we've never once had an incident. We've had people make others uncomfortable. Uh, we've had people do something that's unsafe, and I have walked over, I've engaged with them, I've stood there and very calmly supervised as they've packed everything up. And I said, all right, you know, come back next year, but you're, you're, you're done right now. Uh, you've had a couple of talking to, and we're going we're gonna to have to go and call it right now for your day. No one's ever flipped out. No one's ever caused a big or small incident because of the way that I like to approach people. I have trained myself and I've taught others about containing situations, potentially violent situations, potentially explosive situations, right? I have de-escalated fights just among civilians in bars and elsewhere. I have talked down overly aggressive guards, either professionally, like when I'm on a job, or more likely I've just talked them down in situations where someone wants to kind of be full of bluster and anger and, and really yell, yell their way through a situation. I can remember this poor kid who was on a plane and he was uh, getting a, he was an army private who was flying home and I had given him my seat in first class, something I do a lot when I see people in uh, utilities. And you know, they give, you, they give you more than the free banana when you're up there, right? So he's, 
he was indulging a little bit in the alcohol and a couple other officers on the flight were just really just kicking his balls up in between his shoulder blades. But, you know, they were threatening to dress him down and like, I'm going to discipline you for this. And then the poor kids in the airport terminal. And I'm, I just kind of stepped in. I'm like, look, we're, we're not on post right now. Let's go ahead and like sort this out. And I, you know, thankfully, you know, he didn't get, uh, get a write up from them. So anybody who's done like customer service work has some of these skills. If you deal with the public, if you work in sales, if you work in any kind of situation where you have to know certain social engineering tactics, if I were to use the term pace and lead, uh, it's a very common way to refer to managing people's emotions where you can't just kind of cross into them with, you know, at a, at a weird oblique angle. You really have to kind of dovetail in with where they're tracking and then guide that situation where you need it to go. Many times if someone's, you know, really demanding to speak to a manager, what they're getting is not just a person who's, in, you know, they want to speak to the manager and like, you want that to happen, right? Okay, I'll get the manager. And it's not just because the manager has the authority to, you know, fix the situation, like they can actually offer a refund, but it's probably also someone who has the experience and hopefully even some of the training to contain that person emotionally, right? Being nice and showing, you know, showing calmness in the face of someone who isn't calm is a skill that you have to learn to develop, to resolve conflicts and to do that amicably and professionally. I kind of joke that it's not quite as simple as, you know, the old movie Roadhouse, right? Like, oh, just be nice. Like that, that's a little too broad of a term, but it really does come down to sort of treating people with respect, even when you might not think they deserve respect. They're not acting in a way that is very respectful. It comes down to asking people to do things, even when you might have the authority to make them do things. There's, there's two really good questions you always want to ask yourself in tense situations in life. And that is, who is in control and who thinks they're in control? And many times these uh, do not align, but you might be fully in control and someone else does not realize that you have, the, but still asking them to do something, even when you're not required to, you could force them to, but that's big. And affording some kind of explanation, explain why you need something to happen. This is really uh, illustrated amazingly well. There was um, a journal article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, so in JAMA, there was, it was basically about patient-physician communication. This was talked about in a number of other places and sort of in the sort of the popular science press. Uh, of healthcare triage is a YouTube series that I like. Dr. Carroll referred to this. I'm pretty sure it was referenced in Freakonomics. The idea that the physicians who get lawsuits are not necessarily the ones who have the most problems in their care delivery, but it's physicians who don't take the time to explain things to their patients. Most of the time, what patients want, even though their physician or their care provider, I mean, is a medical professional. They're like, you have this, these are the symptoms, take these pills and don't do this and start doing that. But just barking orders at someone creates this sort of hostile relationship versus physicians who, again, you're not a medical professional as a, as a patient. You probably don't know all these things, but the physicians who take the time and say, well, you have these conditions and this is how it manifests in the body. And so we're really going to look for these signs and this is what we need you to do. So, you know, go ahead and take, you know, we're going to, okay, here's, here's what would manifest and then, okay, this medicine will do this. And, you know, explaining deep knowledge that the patient might not fully digest, but they do understand they're being brought in emotionally on the process of their own health. That's what keeps people, frankly, from suing their doctors, far more from whether their doctors are great at their job. And when I say bringing people in emotionally, making them part of the decision-making process, not just barking orders at them, the thrust of where I went with my B-Sides Orlando talk was that hacker cons aren't always great at this, right? Many conferences that sort of built themselves up out of nothing. Hacker cons, um, fandom in terms of like geek culture and gamer culture, you know, Comic-Con, PAX. These are all events that were sort of stitched together by community volunteers and just magically came into being because people willed it so, they loved it so much. But these aren't always situations where the staff have like great training in certain things, logistics, um, physical security as we see, right? Like we have the DEF CON goons here. 
the DEF CON goons are honestly a remarkable example of growth over time. Because where many events in, let's say, Comic-Con or PAX, right, like gamer cons, long ago, they realized like certain things they're not good at. They're like, we can't do, like, we can't do the logistics and like run ticket sale or right, push ticket sales off onto these professionals. And most of those cons also said, okay, we're huge. We can't like be the guards and the, the police force at the con. We need like to call in the pros. Hacker cons by and large haven't done that. Hacker cons to this day, small ones and even large ones, are still routinely staffed, even in security roles, by volunteers, oftentimes untrained volunteers. And for those of you who kind of know a lot of the complaints that people have leveled against the goon staff uh, and barking orders and the, guy, the idea of like, just, sh I'm, not, and I'm not calling out DEF CON. They've actually made leaps and bounds, frankly, in terms of growth and giving their staff real training, giving their staff de-escalation skills. But many hacker cons to this day still are sort of staffed by people who don't know anything other than to shout orders. And that's not, you know, yes, you can contain a situation if it's like a fight, but that's not the same thing as containing people's emotional problems. And that's what I really wanted this talk to be about. And that's where I wanted to bring some of, you know, my advice to others. One of the key bits of advice that I have for interacting uh, with people, especially under stressful situations, is the idea of wait, and not just wait as in on the clock. I mean, ask yourself, why am I talking? Many, many times, and this doesn't just apply in you know harsh situations, it applies a lot in life, the idea of needing to just speak, always wanting to like not have dead space in the conversation, People love to just really command the conversation. And that can be a problem. It can be a problem in a number of circumstances. And the benefits of not talking, the power you have in a conversation by not talking are really huge and it's untapped for many people. So if you're negotiating, I mean, Tara in her book, right? She, Tara talks about job negotiation, salary negotiation. A lot of these things, you need to leave room in the discussion for other people to want to respond so that they might offer you what you want. You can't just kind of bowl them over. If you, if you take up all the air in the room, you won't get as far as you will if you leave space in the negotiation for them to respond. The idea that she often says with salary negotiation, they, you know, they give you a number and you say, hmm, well, that sounds like a great place to start. Or when they say, well, what are you expecting to make at this job? Instead of just spitting out what you want, you'll say something, well, so I'm really going to need to have you, uh, you know, you explain what the position is offering because that's going to convey a lot of information to me about the value in the role and what value you see in me. And then shut up. Don't talk. Let them force them to name a number first in negotiation and in sales. The idea of investigation. If you are, you know, like interviewing a suspect, right? Anybody who's done any kind of investigation, you know, interrogation room work, like not talking is huge because people can be uncomfortable with silence and they will fill in that silence and offer you way more information than you could ever imagine. Or just counseling and offering aid and, and support for someone, right? If you're there comforting someone, but you're doing all the talking, that's not helpful. That's not helpful to them. That's not how it should work. And all of these, these points, right, investigating, negotiating, and comforting and offering counsel, all of that gets rolled up into one big package if you are working security for an event, right? Here we see Banshee. They are one of the most skilled people I know who can do all of this kind of emotional work. They often will be on security staff at a number of cons, right? Because they're a huge benefit. Whenever Banshee's around, they're helping the event by affording not just their loud commanding presence when needed, <clears throat> but by talking in a way that can be soothing, that can de-escalate. And this is the kind of thing that a lot of this talent is lacking in a number of security staffs. But I want to give people a little crash course in some of these details. So these are a lot of times these are Googleable terms. There are training courses online. I myself have gone through a lot of training we'll talk about. The idea of what's called verbal judo, or verbal, sometimes people will call it Aikido, or verbal self-defense. The idea of professional de-escalation skills in a conflict situation. 
the idea of staying in control, right? If you lose your cool in a tense situation, that situation can, can really get out of hand quickly and you will lose control over it. You might not realize it. In fact, the person you're talking to might not realize it in a tense situation. But a lot of times if someone is mad, their goal, even if they're not processing this, is to get you mad. They want you to be as angry as they are. Maybe they want you as an ally to be angry as they are or to be, you know, I'm riled up, you should be riled up. And th that will give them more power. If they're ranting and raving, but someone they're talking to is remaining calm and professional, it makes them the outlier. So whether they realize it or not, a lot of people try to really push buttons when they're upset and hot and bothered, right? So there's this concept known as tactical civility. It doesn't mean you know, you're being a pushover, letting someone just yell at you, but it does mean that you are being, you're being civil with a skilled approach, with an actual approach of steering toward, again, it's that pace and lead. The idea of getting on someone's level, not just squatting down here, talking to a little kid, right? But getting on someone's level emotionally, seeing the situation through their eyes, anticipating their hesitations, understanding what's driving their emotional state. If you can't try to do that, if you're just, you know, what are you at that point? You're just seeing this person as a problem to be clamped down and disposed of instead of actually seeing this person as a valuable part of your community who you need to, you know, take care of whatever's really bothering them. Probably the, the biggest icon in terms of getting on someone else's level, seeing the world through someone else's eyes would be Fred Rogers, right? If you folk aren't familiar, it's a very short article that is unbelievably touching and summarizes a lot of his mindset. Uh, the Atlantic did an article once on what is called Fredish. It is Mr. Rogers' way of speaking and the amount of rewrites and rewrites and rewrites that Fred Rogers and his staff of child psychology specialists would put into every episode uh, to make sure that they were saying things in a positive way, not a negative way. Try not to be prescriptive, try to be kind, try to anticipate situations where your words might not land the way you're expecting it and always rewording and reworking every point to make it as useful as possible and to really hit the kids on their level. I think that's beautiful. I think it's marvelous. Uh, again, talk about Fred Rogers, like and genuine connections, making your connection with others be genuine. And if people can smell it a mile away, if they think that you're just sort of dressing them down and, you know, on a very superficial level, well, okay, we'll look into that. We can, uh, I guess we can refund your ticket if that's a problem. If they don't feel that you're actually caring about what they're caring about, that's not really speaking to their problem. You're, you're taking care of the superficial stuff. Oh, you know, oh, your, your meal sucked. All right, well, we can take it off the bill. But if, if people don't feel like, oh, that wait staff or that manager really registered that, oh, this, this was a disappointment and I was here with my date and, you know, her meal and my meal were crappy. Yeah, you're giving me my money back, but you can't give me my evening back. Like if that sort of emotional awareness isn't there, people are being like, well, I'm, I'm glad they paid my, my meal back, but I'm not going back to that restaurant. So making genuine connections with people is essential. And this is where we get into that sort of, it's the reason it's called verbal judo is it's a two-step process. When someone comes at you with a problem, you have to validate what they're saying and then try to redirect it into something positive, into something that is better for all right? So there's a talk of a lot of acknowledgement, and then you concatenate with words like however, or and, or but, and then you pivot to very professional, goal-centric discourse, right? So you say, like, you know, someone's, I got a, I got this problem, and I need this thing, and they're yelling and yelling. You say, all right, I acknowledge that, so what you're experiencing is that your room wasn't ready yet, and you got to get all this equipment moved in there right now, and that sounds like it's going to be completely frustrating. You have it on carts right now. You've got people standing around and they're just, they're all just, you know, looking at each other with nothing to do. That is horrible. Um, I want to see that immediately handled. However, the hotel is still turning over those rooms. Now, what I can do, if you can just give me a minute, you can even come with me. We can talk to head of house and see what order they're doing the rooms in because maybe they're just proceeding down the hall. Can we get them to do your room next? That might shave a whole lot. It might not be immediately. It might be in 10 minutes. Can we walk? I'll walk over there with you right now and see if we can speed that up. So you're not just saying like, hey, we're going to go as fast as we can. Just sit tight. You're actually first saying, I'm here with you. 
I acknowledge your problem. However, there's a greater context. Let's try this. So you want to pivot to goal-oriented discourse always. And what are the goals that you're, that you're shooting for, right? Well, keeping people calm. That's always a high one, right? If somebody's tempers are flaring, like ease everyone's heightened emotions. Your second target is to try to get someone to see the goal you're going towards, the goal you're offering as the right goal, right? Can they see your goal that you're driving towards as the one that is desirable? Ultimately, however, you don't just want them to sort of feel dragged along with you. Collaboration is the real activity that you want to shoot for. You want their voice in the establishment of the path towards success, not just now, but even in future. So if you have a con or an event or an organization where someone is experiencing a genuine problem, you know, you want to, you want to settle down everyone's high tempers. You want to get them on board with like, let's fix this. But then it shouldn't just end there. You want the interaction to leave the door open so that they can work with you later. They can give you feedback. They can say, hey, this is what started it. Let's resolve this so someone else doesn't go through this in the future. And of course, you always do have that underlying goal of compliance, right? Like the ultimate underlying target is contain the situation and cause any harmful behavior to stop. If someone is in a fight, you can't go through every one of these steps. But if someone's having an emotional problem, like you can't. And when you're in a security role, this is what you're there to do. You're not there just to, you know, slam the door on someone and say, hey, you know, you've been bothering us. We're trying to have a good time with our friends. Why are you ruining our event? Get out of here. You know, if, if that's all your staff are doing is sort of barking orders and, and kicking people down the road, say, stop, do what I do it my way. Get out of here now. Like, that's not helping. If someone comes up to you and they don't leave calmer than when they first approached you, it's a chance your, your tactics were wrong, right? So how do you make people calm, right? Well, you calm others through empathy. You find out what's driving them. You get on their level and you say, all right, is someone speaking to me out of anger? Are they speaking out of fear? Are they speaking out of ignorance? What is actually driving their non-calm state? And you have, to, you have to really attack it from that angle. You can't just tell people, all right, just calm down. Like, hey, I want you to calm down now. That's never a recipe that works well, right? When's the last time someone's told you, hey, can I get you to calm down for a second? And it's really resonated with you emotionally. That's, that doesn't usually happen. Likewise, another dangerous phrase to use is the phrase, I understand. Don't say like, oh, I understand. We got you. You know, show that you understand. Show you understand by paraphrasing someone's statements back to them. Uh, another really neat tactic in that verbal judo, Doc, Doc Thompson uh, is the person who kind of, in, you know, it created this field and he's uh, no longer with us, but his, his tactic of create a third person in a two person discussion. So you're sort of creating this neutral, almost this passive voice kind of discussion. My buddy Bobak, who works with me, right? Uh, he, he did a lot of customer support for years and he worked uh, in, in, you know, computers and in technology with customer support and the passive voice is great. You know, he's like, oh, um, well, so the thing about this laptop is it, it appears to have suffered physical damage. It appears actually that it's been dropped. And the customer's, are you telling me I dropped it? He's like, I'm not telling you that at all. I'm telling you this computer has been dropped, right? So asking a framework of true false questions, anything to sort of ratchet down options and, and uh, points where people's emotions can flare out. You don't say, I understand just as a statement, but the word understand is really valuable in the right context. And again, I'm borrowing directly from Doc Thompson's verbal judo training here. One of the best and most powerful sentences you can use when you're listening to someone, when you're demonstrating that you're listening and you want to get them on your level emotionally is to say, so let me understand, let me sure I understand what you just said. And then you feed their words back to them because that people love what they what people love to hear what they are talking about. Oh, you're going to tell me about me. I like me. Tell me more about me. Let me understand. Let me make sure I understand you correctly. And then you say, did you just say blah, 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 blah. And it gives them the opportunity to say, well, yes, that, that was this way, but it, no, the third thing, no, he, it's not that he came to me. It's that he took my stuff. Oh, okay. Well, let me understand if blah, 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 blah. So that's what de-escalation drives toward. The idea of this mentality of always steering towards a place where people can become calmer because you're working with them with respect, you're getting on their level. 
This is something that, frankly, because of a lot of very expensive lawsuits across the country, that police departments have had to invest in de-escalation training, right? What's the old mentality before de-escalation was a word? You got cops on the streets and they're engaging with the public and they go through a series of steps when they're trying to get compliance. They would tell someone, you know, hey, can you step over to the side here, sir? You know, maybe, maybe you get a sir thrown in if the person they're talking to has some privilege, if the cops are talking to me. Most of the time it's, hey, move over to the side. Then you order if they don't do that. Hey, what's wrong with you? Get over to the side right now, demonstrating their authority. Then where do you go? Well, you, well, if they're not moving, you threaten. That's what cops would do. Are you deaf? Get up against that wall. You want to get tased. Then what do you got? You, you literally you run out of ground. Cops would glare and stare. And then you got nothing else. You got to go hands on. And that's every step of that is just aching to go hands on. You've got a lot of people who, you know, they say, remember who is in charge and who thinks they are in charge. And if that person thinks that I'm in charge and I, there's no doubt on it, why should I care what this other person has to say? I need compliance immediately. I need immediate deference to my authority. And that's where you get a bunch of violence. That's where you get a bunch of unnecessary dust stops, right? So de-escalation training that a lot of departments are practicing now, the, right off the jump, right? First thing you do is ask. And again, who is in charge and who thinks they are in charge? Those, those facts really haven't changed. But asking someone a question, say, excuse me, would you please, we got to make some room over here so that people can pass by. Can I have you focus, step back so you're not on the sidewalk, please? That doesn't harm the initiative, right? It doesn't harm anyone, it shouldn't harm anyone's ego. Like if a cop is that upset that they, can't, they feel so bruised emotionally that they're being made to ask the public something, I mean, there shouldn't be a badge. So that's the first step that de-escalation training usually goes. You ask someone. And if they're not complying, you give them a quick explanation why, right? Again, unless there's extreme urgency, if there's risk of, of life and limb, you gotta move fast. But if no one's in grave physical danger, you say, look, I wanna make sure that people uninvolved right now can get by. We don't wanna get any blocked right of way reports because I wanna protect your right to be here demonstrating, but we also gotta protect the public's right to get by. Some of these people are just trying to get to this this restaurant, some of the people are trying to get to the clinic over there. We need to make sure people can be through here. You're affording people the idea of like, you're valuable enough to me and I'm treating you like an adult so that I want you to really understand why I'm asking you this. You present options, right? Again, there's no reason that you can't use a friendly voice and friendly body language, visible hands, slow deliberate movements, finger pointing and like shrugging can be kind of misinterpreted as, as being aloof or being insulting. So you give people options and you, you, what the best cadence for this is you point out the positive option first. Remember, you want them to see your goal as the right goal. Then you can show a less desirable option and then you remind them of the positive option. You're like, look, we got it. We got to have people be can come and buy here. Like, I know you want these politicians in this building to hear your voices and you come out here, you want your voice to be heard. And if you can step back just a little bit right here, we can, we can protect your right to keep this, keep this ground and hold this space. Now, if we keep getting reports that citizens can't get by, if you're crowding onto the sidewalks or if you're blocking traffic in the street, I'm going to get orders and everyone else here is going to get orders to move you down to the demonstration area, the larger demonstration area in the city park. But I think that's further away from this building than you want to be. And I don't think you want that. I don't want that. I want you to be able to be here and have your voices heard in a way that's respectful of your fellow citizens. You can also remove onlookers whenever possible. If you are engaging with a person who's causing a problem, like in there in front of their audience, kind of get them away from that audience and give them you know, options. Here's the good option. You don't want the bad option. You want the good option, right? And then you follow through, right? You offer the choice. They can, all right, so what are we going to do here? Would, how can you help me? You've already laid it all out. You've given them options. You've treated them with respect. And then the choice is really in their hands. If they make a good choice, great. Good for everyone. If they make a negative choice, you've already, it's like uh, getting involved with a client. You have a statement of work. You know, you have an entire expectation that's been set in black and white. And the client, if they choose this package, you're going to bill them for this amount of money. If they choose to have this package, it's going to take this long to deliver that report and the, and the testing process. You've already laid it all out. 
and it's the choice is theirs. They can't act, you know, they might be unhappy, but they can't act surprised if you then just professionally and without animosity follow through. You've already spelled out the choices and the outcomes. Now, how does this translate into situations that aren't, you know, just kind of physical muscle based, right? What about business interactions? Let's think about work interactions when you have a plan or an idea and you think there's going to be some friction. There's the idea of, oh boy, somebody else is not going to like this. Well, the old way, sort of the jerk mentality that most people have, the first thing they do is to like quietly build coalitions of, you know, reinforcements and you get all political in the office. You start racking up people to your cause and then you're going to ambush people, right? In a meeting, you spring this new idea and you've got your whole cadre of people that you already brought on board, but that person over there who you knew they were going to be a problem, you spring it on them in public usually and then immediately paint any hesitation as like weakness and no, you know, you just don't see, you can't understand our vision. This is exactly what we need to be doing. We all need to be running, you know, OS2 warp on our workstations for all these reasons and more. And if you, you know, if you don't want to do it, just, you know, your reluctance is dumb and you put them, you know, putting people down saying, oh, you're a Luddite. Oh, you just can't see, you just don't understand. And any time after that meeting, even if it wasn't really resolved, you just paint the picture as like, this has already been resolved. Why are you bringing this up to me? This has already been decided. Get on board or get out. How many people have gone through this at work, right? You know people who behave this way at work. Hopefully you've never done this or maybe you've done little parts of it and you're feeling bad about that fact. And I get it, right? You can't have someone six, eight, nine months after a decision constantly grousing about it. That can get old. But in the immediate aftermath of a decision, if someone is still saying, you know, I've got a problem, this is this stinks, maybe it hasn't been decided. Maybe there's a lot of people that you could have brought on board way better in this process. How can you use an emotionally intelligent approach if you think there's going to be friction with a new policy or a new way of doing things? Well, try to anticipate where that hesitation is going to come from. Again, use empathy. Put yourself in their shoes. Other people, you can... You, can, you know the types of people who are going to cause friction with a new idea. You know it because your, your butthole clenches up just thinking about delivering this news in a meeting. Put yourself in their shoes. Anticipate what may be driving their hesitation. Say, all right, why? Do, it's not just because, you know, Chris hates me. May, well, I mean, maybe it's that because Chris hates everybody. But then you're like, all right, but what kind of objections are they going to say? Maybe you actually rethink your approach. If you start really unpacking it, this is the hardest part, right? If you say, oh man, these people, I, I can anticipate Bill's gonna say this and Susan's gonna say that. And if so many, if there's gonna be a lot of stress, even if you think it's the right way, maybe you rethink how you're approaching it. Maybe you rethink incrementally deploying something or doing it in stages or doing it as a test case or doing it with you know, an actual sunset. Like, all right, we're gonna try it this way. We're gonna just try only having this brand of coffee in the coffee machine and not the special Keurig cups. You can bring them from home. And in, in a month, we're gonna have, a, it's on the calendar, we're gonna revisit it and everyone gets their input. Maybe you have to rethink the approach like that. Maybe you meet in small groups first. Sometimes instead of building coalitions of like other people that are gonna charge in and yell and over, speak over others, maybe you actually sit down with somebody who you think is going to be the biggest problem. Maybe you talk to them privately, not in the big meeting. Now that's really swinging yourself out there with no sword and no armor. Because what if they start and go build a coalition and they're going to crush you? Like It sounds like you live in a politic, political hellscape of an office and you shouldn't work there. And those objections, when they happen, give visibility to them. Literally use those words that I've been telling you. Like, okay, now let me make sure I understand your concerns. You have a problem if we do pizzas on Thursday instead of Friday because you, you know, so many people always go to kickboxing after work and you don't want people vomiting pizza on each other. Oh, well, what if we did blah, blah, blah? You know, don't try to quash other people's concerns. Literally give visibility to them, put them in the spotlight, and then why am I talking? Give them room in the conversation to speak, to maybe even overspeak. Maybe their position is irrational. Maybe they will sound irrational if you just give them enough room to run. How many of us are going through this right now with parents and relatives and friends with the coronavirus, right? Like, 
if we're worried about, you know, coronavirus disease 19, and you're trying to explain this, like convincing your parents to just stay the F home. We've been going through this, my wife and I, with some of our family members. There's an amazing, amazing article. Uh, Anne Helen Peterson, if you guys haven't seen it on Twitter yet, uh, her article, I think it was in BuzzFeed of all places, but it's how millennials are talking to their boomer relatives about the coronavirus. Uh, Google it, look, look it up. It's a lot of these relatives of ours and these friends of ours don't understand that they are the old people now. And a lot of us don't understand that we are the generation who is now talking to our elder relatives with some authority. It was, you know, when I was growing up, I would watch my parents talk to my grandparents and be like, you know, ma, you can't do it that way. This is what, and that just made sense to me because my parents were like, they were this font of wisdom and their authority. Oh, and my, the older generation, like they need help. We are that font of authority now. That's freaking scary for some people out there, right? But we are it. And we need to be offering this guidance to our families. And it's hard to do that kind of talking when they're not seemingly listening or believing that a problem applies to them. There was a wonderful uh, little bit about donating supplies recently. People were talking about if now that there's starting to be certain community initiatives where hospitals are saying, look, we're going to try to do a collection point for masks and nurses need these kind of sanitizers if you have them. People who have been hoarding and such, the approach shouldn't be shame-based because shame doesn't get you there emotionally, right? You, you can just finger wag and be like, you shouldn't have bought all that crap. Make them the hero instead. People much rather be the hero than be shamed. Be like, couldn't you make a nurse's day? Do you know you're going you're gonna to delight them? We're gonna, we really want to see as much as we can. We're going to try to fund this initiative. We're going to try to get all these supplies in. We need your help. And for community defense, right, for, for any kind of mutual aid, if you can get involved in any mutual aid initiatives, not just during a time of crisis, right, like every one of us out there, who protects us, we protect us. Live that every day. But mutual aid organizations that are springing up, offering aid to your neighbors, no one wants to say to the neighbor, like, well, it looks like you didn't plan properly at all, right? I mean, you can't say that. People don't want to feel like a charity case. Every initiative that I've, every reach out, every, every initial contact we've had to all of our neighbors, I've been reaching out to them constantly and saying, hey, you're probably all squared away, but in case there's one or two little things you forgot, or if we have an abundance of something and, you know, a lot of, like, let's say you're stuck and you're missing one key ingredient, you're going to use this time to like cook more, we might have more stuff. Please reach out. If you, and, you know, it makes me sound like I'm just offering them a lemon or some butter, but if they reached out and they're like, we literally don't have any freaking fresh vegetables. Like, oh, well, we got a big delivery of them. Let me, what do you need? Giving them, it, it reminds me a lot in Shawshank Redemption. If anyone saw it, it's a lovely film, uh, a very harsh film to watch sometimes, but it's the scene where Andy Dufresne is talking to the guards and he's literally offering them help. He's offering the head guard banking advice. And to deescalate him, he's like, you know, he's like, and I'm sure I feel foolish even telling you all this, sir. I'm, I'm certain a man of your education would have looked this information up yourself. And he gives that guy room in the conversation saying, that's damn right. I would have looked it up. I don't need you telling me what's going on. Because yeah, of course you wouldn't, you wouldn't have needed that. But if you do, if you need to have any questions, I, I'm always happy to help, sir. Giving people this space to not feel, you know, like the charity case of the neighborhood. This is all emotional work that you can be doing in your communities. And getting back to securities at event, right? Event security and organizational security, victim assistance. After a situation is contained, your job isn't done. That's just one half of the emotional work. Uh, providing victim assistance after the fact is critical. And that's something even some of the best events we have are not great at. I know events that contained an issue of harassment, like on a dance floor, like a woman was gro groped by somebody. And the event did a great response. Like they ran in, they, you know, they, pro they really actually processed it. They talked to the guy. They really did actually follow it. They said, oh man, this guy was in the wrong. We, you know, he's kicked, blah, blah, blah. But then it turns out he was kicked out for just that year and he was allowed back the next year. And no one thought to like contact the victim and be like, oh, by the way, that guy, because, you know, he was really drunk and he was super apologetic and it's never happened before. We have made the decision he's going to be allowed to return. We, he really understands. We're actually going to tell him he can show up on be on a staff, but he can't drink the whole con. We're going to watch him. No one told the victim that. So she wound up just like seeing this guy in a staff shirt. Like, what the hell is this? That kind of victim management is critical. Now, I know a lot of people out there are thinking at this point, like, hey, let's, let's all calm down. Like, you're just some, you know, 
old headed moose who crashes through walls and breaks into things. You're a brute force guy. You're not an expert in, you know, human emotional management. Okay. That may be your opinion. Your opinion just happens to be wrong. Like I am trained and certified by the department of justice. I have gone through weeks of training and prep as a victim services provider and as a counselor to victims of violent crime. So like, this is very much my lane and I have, a lot of knowledge here that I'm just trying to drop on you so we can all calm down about you're not an expert in this. I like the, there's an old quote that Howard Zinn has talked about from the actor Peter Ustinov when he spoke out events against the Vietnam War. People said, he's not an expert. And Ustinov said, look, there are experts in, in little things. They're expert in this fact and in that field, but there's, there's no experts in big things. There's no moral experts. We all have the right to speak about moral things. And uh, yeah, keep, Keep your voices in the conversation. Don't let people hush you up in this kind of topic. If they tell you, you're not a clinician, you're not a certified psychiatrist. Speaking of, we don't need to do anything. This, is, this isn't your place to talk about it. Our organization is fine. We're already doing great. Are you really doing great as an organization if you're not tracking any data? It's like right now with the coronavirus outbreaks, right? Like we can say, oh, look, our country has way fewer cases of coronavirus than Italy. I mean, do we? We're not freaking testing anybody, so how the hell do we know? Is it lack of incidents that makes you think your organization is great, or is it just lack of reports by victims? There's a whole bunch of things that the DOJ highlights in the training about why victims don't come forward, barriers to reporting, right? So lack of faith in the system, uh, not trusting people to help, not trusting people to respect confidentiality. These are all real concerns that victims have and the reason that people don't get to work with victims is because they just poof in the wind. They say, well, I'm never going to be helped. These people don't listen to me. They don't, they're not going to care. Why should I engage with this organization if no one's listening? We have to collaborate with more voices if you want to create an environment where there aren't barriers to reporting. If everyone on your staff looks like me, there are going to be people in your organization who aren't comfortable speaking to that person. And regarding reaching out and getting a more diverse staff, collaboration and reaching out to other groups, right? When women or LGBTQ folk in our community have spoken up with concerns, how many times have they brought those up in discussions to people who really represent them? How many times do they feel the urge to collaborate or do they feel like they'll just be shut down? I've got a whole bunch of phrases on the screen for you right now. Move beyond simple tolerance, embrace and celebrate differences. You have to you know, have diversity of economic backgrounds, different genders, right? Ego is a problem. Accept all these differences in culture, gender, gender identity, orientation. Why am I making a big deal out of all these phrases? Because they're not fringe concepts. This isn't like SJW woo woo crap. These are all statements that I'm drawing directly from my Department of Justice training materials, right? The barrier of inclusion, right? Barriers to inclusion in your staff and events. The phrase recognize imbalance of power and issues of oppression and privilege, right? Recognize oppression, recognize privilege. Again, I'm not talking about some kid's term paper from like Colorado Springs University. This is the Department of Effing Justice that is putting this in black and white. And if the government, the Fed can be saying this in a criminal justice context, I think there are some values here that we can benefit from learning from. It is necessary to accept others' values. You don't have to agree with them, but you do have to not judge them, right? And this is where we get into things like codes of conduct. And the fact that we, we're gonna spend some time on this is insane. Uh, codes of conduct get a whole bunch of rise out of people. There's so many hands emerge from the snack bag in order to bang out very poorly typed insults on their keyboards about codes of conduct. Oh, you know, they don't really need that. Women just make up all these claims of harassment. There's a whole, you know, basket of idiots online that have no emotional intelligence, just taking pot shots at the code of conduct constantly, like it's a, like it's a sport. You have everybody's favorite fascist who's still on plenty of staff at cons for reasons passing understanding, offering the key argument that you get, right? Oh, a code of conduct doesn't keep people safe. That you're just a freaking idiot if you think a code of conduct can keep you safe. That's not protecting you. This is the analogy that I would like to make to eviscerate that kind of crap. Let's talk for a second about drunk driving laws. In 1906, drunk driving first, there's the first time it ever became illegal. Like on the books, the idea of driving a car under the influence 
was no longer permitted. Now, it wasn't until the 1940s, however, that actual specification in the law started appearing because science was able to determine things like field sobriety testing. We didn't really have scientific standards until the 40s. And then it was all throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s that we saw much more evolution. We saw a lot of social pressure groups and we actually saw the uniformity of all state laws across America in 2004. That's where all standards became, you know, locked down more or less. Now, imagine, I want you to imagine something. Imagine you're in a bar, you've got a drunk moron next to you and there are a few whiskeys in and they're like, oh man, you're telling me drunk driving laws are a good thing? That's bullshit. You told me they weren't even standardized till 2004. What do you think? Laws can't stop bad behavior. Look, I can drive right now. No one can stop me. Drunk driving law can't stop me. Why do we have the laws? You'd think that person was an idiot. Rightfully so. Of course, DUI laws don't prevent drunk driving. They exist to address and have ramifications for drunk driving. All right? So I want you to imagine the following analogy here. On one hand, we're gonna have two different drivers here. One hand, you've got kind of an average middle-aged white guy, right? And he's just, you know, I just typed middle-aged average white guy into Google. On the other hand, I want you to imagine a trans black woman. Uh, and we'll call her Andrea, because she's in fact Andrea Jenkins, the first trans black woman elected to any public office in America. The other guy, we'll just call him Dave, because I don't know who this stock image guy is. Now let's say they're both at a restaurant. It's kind of like a restaurant and bar, right? So maybe Dave is in the bar section and he's watching a hockey game or something uh, and he drinks like five beers. Andrea sits down, has a, you know, a little pasta dinner, has some wine, maybe a glass and a half of wine. Now an hour and a half after they both walked in, Dave is not legal to drive. Andrea still is. They both get in their cars, they both drive home. Now with or without drunk driving laws, either one of them can decide to do that, right? The law doesn't stop them. That's not the point. The point of having a drunk driving law and having the laws we have with specificity, with actual statistics in the law, right, with biological data about blood alcohol levels, is what happens if they get pulled over. If Dave gets pulled over, what's the likelihood he's in the same societal sort of in-group as the officers making the stop? What's the chance that in a small enough town, he's literally like friends with them, like he goes bowling with them on the weekends or something? What unconscious preconceived notions might come into play that will inform how Dave will behave? Will he be relaxed? Will he be all calm and cool? What will come into play in terms of how the police are treating him? And most critically, if there are no specific statutes, right, how much flexibility do the officers have in deciding whether or not Dave is impaired? Can you see how this flexibility can, can impact with their subconscious bias, right? Now, what about Andrea? Remember, she's not drunk, but do you think she might be nervous? Do you think she and people in her community may have had a lot of problems interacting with officers? With a hint of wine on her breath, if there was no specific like blood alcohol stats in the, st in the, in the statute, what do you think was a chance that she actually gets taken in? Maybe she beats the charges, right? Because like, okay, she's not actually drunk, but she's having a way worse night than Dave. Specificity under the law establishes these really clear-cut standards, making it unlikely that authorities will let things slide the wrong way due to systemic prejudice. Now, some people will say like, ah, you know what, our con, we've got a code of conduct. It's one line. Be excellent to each other. That's not a code of conduct. That's a motto. And it's a nice sentiment, don't get me wrong, but it's not a clear set of rules and expected standards behavior. That's a billboard. Just like this billboard, like still let friends drive drunk. That's a great sentiment. It, con it conveys society sort of broad norms that they would like to see enforced. But it's not an enforceable DUI law. It's not a statute with BAC levels and ramifications and how long you do or don't lose your license. If you send a bunch of authority figures out into the world with a mission to like enforce these wishes and no other guidance, how's that going to go for Dave? And how's that gonna go for Andrea? That is why we have drunk driving laws that literally state, 
this is what an ALCO test you know, has to show in someone's bloodstream. That is why conferences have codes of conduct that say, these are the expected standards of behavior, these are the penalties for violating those standards. These exist, these codes and these laws exist because people are imperfect. You and I are all imperfect. Everyone at the staff level is imperfect. And our human you know, imperfections come into play when we're trying to contain events, uh, incidents, and we're trying to keep our events running smoothly. Anyone out there who says, oh, my event doesn't need a code of conduct, is either asserting that they are perfect and they have flawless judgment, or that their attendees are perfect and have and some of these tools, they're at your disposal. De-escalation training exists. Verbal judo is a training course that exists. I mean, Doc Thompson has passed away. Other people have taken up the mantle of that. There is the victim assistance training, victim services training, crisis counseling training. All of these are like muscles that you have to build over time. You're not just birthed into the world knowing all this stuff. Everything we've learned is something we've had to practice and get better at. These codes of conduct don't just like spring fully formed out of the earth. They come from trainings, they come from workshops, they come from tabletop discussions. If you are an organization or an event and you want to get into this territory, speak to other people who have invested this effort and invest a modicum of effort on your part. If you're not prepared to do that, are you really telling your attendees and your, your people around you that you're doing all you can to make sure they have a good time? Or are you just kind of coasting through because you're like, oh, cons are fun. I want to run a con. Yay, it's a party. Try to connect directly with people, by the way. I mean, social media is a monster. Uh, it's a well-known phenomenon that the emotional distancing that occurs on social media can cause people to react very badly and very immature. Things get said. Uh, again, like coronavirus, because it's timely, right? We just saw a public official on Twitter call it the Chinese virus today. Like, I think it was a senator from Oklahoma, possibly. Uh, anybody out there that you see calling it the Chinese virus or Winnie the flu, like, funny. It's a funny line because, you know, Jinping and doesn't want to be called Winnie the Pooh, but like, that's racist horseshit. That's that you're a racist asshole if you're spreading that kind of crap on social media. Just like with the Spanish flu. You know, the Spanish flu wasn't actually from Spain. Some theories said it might have originated in parts of Asia. Some theories said it was originated in America. We'll never really know, but folk blamed the Spanish for it, for a quirk of history reasons. Do frontline work with your organizations. Uh, learning these skills doesn't really pay the dividends if you just live up in an ivory tower and you're disassociated and disconnected from the actual frontline of your organization. If, if you're not among the people, if you're not among the people really experiencing what's going on, all this idea of like your emotional intelligence, it doesn't come into play because you're not connecting with others. So try to reach out more than just on social media. Try to reach out to people in person. Not right now. Like we can, we can virtual fist bump it until the corona scare is over, right? But it's like, you know, the stories. If you're a manager of a coffee shop or something, like are you just the boss in the office or do you actually spend some time with customers? If you run a part of your organization at your company, do you ever get out of your office? Do you ever do frontline customer support anymore? Do you ever work with the, the coders and the team on the, on the low levels of the org chart? or are you just up on the executive level? Uh, use your emotional intelligence wisely and make genuine connections with others. And that is something that I hope we can all develop as a skill. And that is a, an area that I really would like to see hackers get better at. We're good at so much shit. Uh, let's put this as one more tool in the toolbox that we can use. Thank you very much. And I would love to do some questions. Uh, I'd love for you to reach out to me on social media or otherwise. And I hope, uh, I hope you found some of that informative. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Deviant. Um, yeah. That was awesome. And everyone, if you want to ask questions, this is the time to ask away. Um, if you want, you can also raise your hand and we can, I can unmute you so you can talk or you can always write a Q&A for us. Let's see. Is there a, is there, are they raising their hands in the chat or are they? In the participant attendee section. So if anyone raises their hand, I'll allow you to talk and ask a question. Oh, we got a cue. All right. Someone says, Angela says, awesome. Thanks so much for your time and great advice. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Oh, there we are. I see. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Everyone's being so kind. Right so on. nice. Thank you. 
we had a whole session on like empathy and communication and look at what's happening. See, you're starting a reaction, a awesome. positive reaction. <laughs> now I know um, you had uh, some previously collected oh, yeah. questions, right? Yeah. So one is overall, how can we improve on Twitter, especially since we have trolls and we have cyber stalking, how do we practice de-escalation? Cause I know that, Majority of times when someone does something bad, uh, someone will take a picture of it and then share it everywhere online. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering what you think would be the best and most appropriate way to respond to someone who is crossing lines. So we'll come back to who is in control, but who thinks they're in control. A lot of times trolls think they're in control when they are not. And uh, in my opinion, there is anyone, you know, operating a sock puppet account or I mean, my, I have been subject to no end of hate and abuse, but I usually find out about it from someone else telling me like, hey, what's this uh, person saying about you? I'm like, I really who? And I look and follow a link because it didn't show up in my feed. And I'm like, oh, the person with like the egg avatar and four followers. Yeah, guess what? I don't care. Like block. Like that person's gone. That's the, we, we need to use the block button a lot more, block and ignore and mute a lot more. Because if someone isn't engaging with you in a genuine way, if, if all they're really doing is wanting to sow discontent and hate, uh, that's not, again, that's not a person who's being really valid about their, they're not acting in good faith. So there's a difference between, yeah, that's probably my best answer is identify the difference between good faith concerns and expressions of concern and just hateful crap, hateful nonsense. Uh, you, you are under no obligation to fight with you know, hateful nonsense. You're, as the old saying goes, you're not under obligation to, to, make, to do the reading for someone else if they haven't. Love it. Okay, we did get a question. So one person has stated, I would like to practice using de-escalation techniques so that I'm not winging it when someone is emotionally distressed. Can mm -hmm. you suggest anything other than grab a friend and pretend? So I think that's a really good question. Um, if you, it's sort of like the difference between reading about martial arts versus actually sparring. Like you can academically digest something, but on, it's the old phrase, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? Unless you've actually gone toe to toe in a stressful environment, it's hard to, it's hard to really put that knowledge into praxis, right? So yes, there are workshops, there are training workshops. Uh, I would again look into sort of community aid, mutual aid type uh, situations where there are, there, I know that, um, in fact, Tara was telling me her church is doing a de-escalation training. It may be postponed right now, it may be moving online, uh, just for dealing with people who are in a mental crisis because we do a lot of outreach. Uh, there's, you know, I've been in like in the kitchen, like serving food next to her. And you can see like someone is just not, um, they're not equipped with the full mental toolkit that in society would reduce a lot of the friction they're experiencing. It has this whole workshop about if you actually encounter someone who is in mental distress, like you can't just put on your cape and be like, oh, I love the world, I'll help. Like you can be making it worse. So I do like the, I like the phrasing that was used there. Like how do we practice this? And the answer is look for local workshops. If you search de-escalation training in your area, or if you can't find any, reach out to, I mean, you could try to reach out to me. Uh, someone who is an amazing, amazing voice for community, uh, watching out for community is someone named Chad Loader. Uh, I don't know if you follow Chad on Twitter, Chloe, or if I retweet him sometimes. Uh, he really is just a big hearted soul. And he is a voice that I would ask. I'm sure he has gone through certain training like this because just seeing him interact with others tells me he is very emotionally aware. I don't know if I follow him or not, but I will definitely look into it. You know, I always can look for anyone who has a big heart in the, in the community. I feel like yeah. we need more people to have some empathy and like just try to understand each other a little mm -hmm. bit before escalating, which is the entire thing of your talk. Yeah. Um, so I have a, another question is, how did you even get into physical security? Like what were you doing before you got into this field? Yeah, this uh, the old like the sort of there's a joke answer that I give, which is sort of real. Also, I give it a, like to the press when they ask me this question, which is I got in by some of the right friends, some of the wrong friends. Like having, and the, the fully fleshed out answer there is like I had very wise friends who were sort of working in this field, 
when I was getting into the lock picking uh, scene as a hobby, there are other people in that scene. Mike Glasser is a great example. He's from New York area. The name's name is Laz, right? So Laz is a security professional, but I met him through lock picking, right? So I started to see this, oh, this is an actual career you can do. And likewise, I had some of the wrong friends. Like growing up, I was the kid. I wasn't like a bad kid, right? But I was definitely the kid who didn't think all the rules applied. And some friends and I would like to go exploring places we weren't necessarily supposed to be. I know a lot of hackers do some urban exploration and sometimes don't pay attention to the posted signs. So that gave me some degree of... Uh, on the job training before I was on the job in getting into places that I shouldn't be. Uh, ultimately, it was a security consulting job, a digital job. That's where I was consulting just in my local area back east. Uh, it was a law office. The sysadmin had like rage quit in the middle of the day. And someone was like, that's, that's not good. Is, I don't think he's coming back. And these, law, these lawyers kind of looked at each other and tried to figure like, well, we can't just send a cease and desist and be like, don't touch our servers. Like, we need to know what's happening. So somebody called a friend who called a car dealership who called someone else. And they, oh, well, there's this guy who fixed our servers and this, call him. So someone called me and I was like, oh, well, I can make some time in my schedule to I should meet, which means if you're an independent consultant, I can put on pants and like get over there. So I hustle across town. I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I'm so-and-so's friend. You got this problem. Like they explained it. They said, yeah, you know, we don't know if this guy is remotely in our system or not, but we, this is, we need to deal with this. Uh, we got a locksmith on the way, sit tight. As soon as we get into his office, we're going to let you get onto those servers. And 15, 20 minutes in the lobby, just kind of, it was pre-Twitter. So Lord knows what I was doing. I was just sitting there, probably very bored. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm on the clock. Like, do you want to just take me to this office and let me see, let me see what we're talking about here. So they walked me down to this and I was expecting like a server room, but it was just one more office. Like a building has many offices. I'm like, oh, it's just, it's like this, it's like the same doors that you have in all these offices. Do you want me to just open this door? And they're like, you could try to do that. I'm like, well, if you're going to absolve me of any, I don't think I'm going to damage anything. Let me see what I can do. And I was able to get the door open really fast. It was actually, I didn't even pick it. I bypassed it. Uh, so I like popped the handle. Okay. Got in. And I'm like, oh, all right. Well, that was easy. Got cancel the locksmith. So I'm like, Pnordal, NT boot, restarting servers. And I'm like, all right, what do you want your root password to be? Okay. I'm like, okay, it looks like RAS services aren't running. You don't have telnet. You got nothing is turned. No, you, there's nothing remote. We can do a full workup next week if you want, but like right now you should be fine. Uh, here, take your root password. He's, he's like, oh yeah, uh, there's a password. Yeah, great. What'd you do to that door? I'm like, oh yeah, doors kind of aren't installed right here. They're all pretty vulnerable. That sucks. He's like, yeah, well, hang on, Steve. He's like, can you show him what you just did to that door? And that they had us back not to do more server stuff because they had hired a new IT guy next week, but they had us back to kind of just go through their whole office and do a whole workup of like all the vulnerabilities. And then we did it for a car dealership and then we started getting other clients and a huge credit uh, here in town, like Tara and I, uh, much love for uh, Jeff and Casey and D D Dark Tangent, right? So friends of ours, but before they were even good friends, like DT just reached out to me at DEF CON he was like, hey, I really love that lockpick stuff you've been doing. You know, could you ever want to like do that at Black Hat? And I was like, that would be a training? Like people would pay money for that? He's like, yeah, just try it. I think it would be a fun topic. I think you're good at talking. You're a good teacher. So yeah, we've had a Black Hat training since like 06. And everyone, you know, people look at Black Hat trainers and they're like, oh man, I'd love to be making all that money. Like, let's be honest, like you make money per student. But a lot of times you, you're there, you're getting business, you're getting, you're getting, you'll have whole students in your class that'll learn your stuff and then they'll do a lot of it until they can reach a point where they're like, this is a little above me. I should call someone. I'm probably just going to call the person that I paid to teach me this. So the, our business has grown from there and that's, it's grown and grown. And Bobak, my, my great, uh, probably my best friend at this point in the world, Bobak had this idea for a company and he was really bold and he crossed the country to live with me in Philly. And that's, that's what we've been doing for over a decade now. It's kind of a long story, I guess, to that, to that answer. I actually love it. Um, that was good. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so we got an anonymous question, which mm -hmm. is, uh, I know I have some privilege, and when someone who is not as privileged as me is experiencing distress, how do I find help from members of that person's community without expecting them to do all the emotional work or expecting them to speak for all yeah. members of their community? So this is the classic, 
and we can rephrase this, it, it occurs not just, we can even make it a more neutral question. It's not even when someone's in distress, but when someone looks around at their con and they're like, oof, we don't have enough women speakers. The first instinct is to then reach out to a bunch of women speakers and be like, hey, how do I get more women speakers? You know, and like every prominent woman I know in technology who is not like, you know, like that's not their, their job shouldn't be doing the heavy lifting. So that's, this person is speaking to that in that same kind of like in a crisis context or in a broader context. And it's sort of, I'm not going to give the easiest answer, but it has to do with, it's, it's like saying, boy, I'm really hungry. I really, I wish my ground was spurting forth vegetables. How do I make vegetables happen? Well, the answer is like, you should have done like a number of things before now that would have made the vegetables already be there and it wouldn't be a problem. So laying down the track early on in the process, uh, laying, laying track to make your event so welcoming that you all, before someone has an incident, there should, and like, oh, who's on staff that looks like this person? Like you should have already had a diverse staff before you look around and be like, oh crap, all of our speakers are white dudes. Like that, that moment of, oh, what do I do? You can head that off at the pass by creating an environment where people want to submit to your con, like have a really robust code of conduct, have prominent non-white, non-cis, non-het guys, like have other people that don't look like my dumbass, like prominently on your CFP team, have them tweeting about, have them organizing the event with you. And trust me, more and more people will be submitting. It's people don't submit in diverse crowds to Diana initiative because it's like the lady event. They submit because it's perceived to be an event that is taking shit seriously, making a safe environment. It's to an outsider. People might not understand that distinction, but there's a lot of people most of whom don't look like me, who are like feverishly nodding their heads right now. Or me, who say preach. <laughs> yeah. yeah, long before your event even has like a name and a venue, you should be having like a weekly brunch in a diner somewhere with a number of people who are going to be core on the event team and they shouldn't all look like you. I like that. I mean, we come in all shapes and sizes. We all look different. We need to be represented. Um, any final questions? And thank you for staying a little bit longer, Deviant. Really oh, appreciate fun. it. Thank you for sticking around. Again, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in my house. <laughs> well, apparently we're now in lockdown. I'm in San Francisco, everyone. So we're officially on lockdown. So we can't leave our house. Um, oh, when will the recording be posted? Probably this week or next week. But it'll be within two weeks process every time. It looks like Travis, who I think uh, is, if Travis is related to, I know a couple of people with the last name Wagoneer on Twitter, um, their comment about, it, remember, it reminds them of familiarization and prolonged exposure without incident leads to a loss of appreciation of risk. That is a really, that is a really cool um, statement. The idea that the longer and longer we go without a problem, it causes people to get lax and causes people to relax into a softer posture. Uh, that's a really good point to think about. We should always be searching and you can kind of, you can kind of counter that by always search for little things that maybe you wouldn't have considered it. Like we didn't have time to deal with that before, but like find little things. I used to describe it uh, when I was a little kid and I would be weeding in the garden with my parents, right? The first thing you do is you go and you pull like the really big weeds. And once you've done that and you're like, wow, I got all of them. That's look at all these big weeds. Like I'm done. But you look and now you see like the smaller weeds. And they weren't really on your radar because like all you saw was the big tall dandelions. But like once the big shit's gone, there's like smaller weeds, like pull them. And then if you've got the time next, like pull, pull even smaller weeds, pull the seedlings. And the more you, the more you dig and get deeper, it's like a fractal, right? You get deeper and deeper in, you'll find more granular detail as you go. There's always more stuff you can cover. Like here's what we did great. And let's, let's look for new areas. We can always, you can always improve something else. A lot of us are big into self-improvement. Yeah. I think the one thing that I always find interesting, the, so research has shown the thing that makes us different from animals, they believe is because humans can ask the question, why? Yeah. And by asking the question, why that allows us to understand each other or question anything that we're being told 
making us think outside the box. And I think that's one of the things like a bunch of hackers in the community, that's probably one of the reasons they're in the community is because they ask the question, why should I do it this way when I could do it that way? Or why should I do the following things when I found something that's a shortcut because some of us came in as gamers. (laughs) Um, So it's always fascinating to ask the question why. So I always like try to tell people that anyone has the power of learning how to have empathy just by asking the question, why is the person doing this? Why do they do what they do? Mm -hmm. So then you can understand and try to understand because I feel like like you were saying is that the only way we're going to grow as a community and understand each other is really just wanting to know what's going on in the other person's mind. And you can't know exactly what's going on in their mind, of course, but trying to understand it um, as a way of, I guess, a meditative way of de-escalating a situation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for running this. And thank, thank you, you. to everyone. I'm still seeing Andy and Ben and other comments and people are just, I'm really loving the feedback. I will look for it on Twitter as well. I was I already tweeted the uh, link to that like boomers and millennials about COVID article if you're looking for it. I'll, I'll give good. Chad a shout out as well. Mention him just so anyone who's looking for me on there can find him. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, thank you everyone. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much for being on and uh, let us know if you ever want to do a talk about anything you want. I would love to have you as a guest again. I would so love thank to you again, that. Deviant, and thank, thank everyone you. for attending. And I will post this recording as soon as possible. Awesome. All right. Stay Bye safe, everyone. All right.